Welcome to another session with my little tangerine tiger. Um, today, I say today, but over the next few days, because I'm going to be dipping in and out of this because I've got quite a few projects on beside this, um, so you might see me get handsome, ugly, fat, thin, change of clothes. Um, you'll see me messing around with the electrics. Now, I thought I'd start off by doing the easy stuff at the top here, but it turns out it's not quite as easy as I thought it was going to be. It is pretty simple, um, but I'm not an electrician by profession, but I understand quite a bit about electrics. And the one thing that is key to this is making sure that we choose the right sort of power cable that we're going to connect these things up with. We want some coax cable to connect between here and the Roida controller and then we need some powerful wire to connect between here and here. Now this is only a short distance and then we're also going to require heavy duty mains input cable to here because when we look on the rating plate here it tells us that the output is 12 amps roughly but it also tells us that at 240 volts we're still going to require 7.5 amps. Now 7.5 amps is not too bad um, but it's going to consume quite a bit of the power that runs through the emergency stop switch as we've talked about before. This is not much different to what would normally happen with the high voltage power supply. We're not going to be putting too much extra load through that emergency stop switch. You may remember that I've got a separate power inlet here to take the load from the extract fan and the air assist, the air compressor. That load does not pass through the emergency stop switch. These are running through a separate relay controlled by the emergency stop switch. As I was digging around trying to find out what power this device actually consumes, this is the cloud ray unit which you can go and see on their website and you can see it costs, I mean I've got a CR30 which is what this one is and it's about two and a half thousand US dollars. Okay and here's the rating for it and it says 48 volts DC 12.5 amps. Well that just happens to miraculously coincide with the output of this power supply. So I'm not entirely sure whether or not that number is correct. I thought, well, I'll go and have a check elsewhere, just see what the, the original manufacturer specifies. And this is the original manufacturer. Look, Sino Galvo. And I will post a link to this page on the description below this video. So you can go and look at it for yourself. It says 48 volt DC with a maximum current of 12 amps. It looks as though it does require 12 amps, which is quite heavy duty wiring. The other interesting thing here is it says maximum heat load, 575 watts. So that this thing is gonna pump out quite a lot of heat. And I think I'm gonna have to put some additional fans in here to blow air through this control cabinet. As I was looking for uh, the link, I came across the same product supplied by Edmunds optics and it appears to be half the price that cloud ray are charging but then when you look into it a little bit deeper you find that mm, don't know what that number actually means because here we've got a 20 watt output unit which costs 2700 pounds so that's probably what three and a half thousand dollars and the 40 watt unit is what probably five is probably close to six thousand dollars you remember how i mounted this unit on four cheap aluminium pillars that I just turned up into tubes. I could buy a mounting bracket here for £212. I just thought there were some interesting numbers there for you to digest. So that means we should be able to get away with standard um, IEC 10 amp computer cable into the machine. The link between here and here is going to be a bit more demanding because we've got to carry at least the capability of 12 amps there. Now, I've got some fairly heavy duty mains cable here. Well, it's a bit more than mains cable, it's industrial cable, which is rated at 300 volts, which is no problem, but it's three cores at 
15 AWG capable of taking up to 28 amps when it's what they call chassis wiring so I'm going to have to take the cores out of here and we're just going to put a link between here as open cable but I just point that out because you can't use thin cable like this to link these two pieces together it's got to be heavy duty mains cable I've played with these little spaces a few times trying to get the screws in and lined up with the spaces four of them and it's tricky so what I've done now I've just put a pin a three millimeter pin down the middle of them to hold them in place but what I should be able to do this time is to locate the pins in the holes like that remove a pin and replace it with a screw on the back of this power supply very conveniently we've got a couple of M3 holes so there you go that's nice and stable on there so I might have to be a little bit um, non-conventional with my connections here because if I put them out this way it's going to obstruct the back face that I want to use to reference with now although I don't think there's a problem here with this against the back face because this is only 48 volts I feel slightly uncomfortable about leaving these terminals very slightly exposed here on the edge they're not close to the metalwork that's at the back here but but I'm going to be sliding this backwards and forwards along this back plane here so what I've done I've just knocked up a little teeny weeny PETG shield just to slide over there I mean, it doesn't fix on it just slides over and gives us some sort of protection between the metalwork and those potentially well they're bare terminals but then they're, they're not going to spark because they're only 48 volts okay so basically that's that wiring done I've done further checks and the only connection that we need on here it says in the manual I've checked with Cloudray I lack an understanding of some sort of how this system is going to work I'm wiring it up correctly and then we'll have to find out by hooking the oscilloscope in what's actually happening to this PWM that I'm going to connect it to is it truly PWM or is the PWM somehow reconfigured when I change the vendor settings away from a glass tube to an RF tube that's the sort of thing that Rueda will do and they don't tell you anything about it in the manual it's another day change of plan again look what we've got here we've got a piece of three millimeter cold rolled mild steel with a bend this is the new table without any further ado rather than having it laying around I'm going to fit it every one of those nuts is loose <laughs> but I can't take the table off because the table is fixed down with these bolts so I'd have to remove a hell of a lot of stuff to get the table off or I could lift the bolt, lift these fixings up and then I could um, cut, cut this away but this is not doing any harm as it sits here if I've got my dimensions right I don't believe it that's how much I need to take off I think well let's just have a look see whether we can actually squeeze this in in, in any way So we'll just give it a gentle kiss. Now I've put a fold across the back edge for a couple of reasons as you'll see in a minute. But of course the great advantage of putting a bend is it automatically straightens the material. Whereas this unbent edge, lots of light under it, it's bent this way. But it's not going to worry me because we're going to flatten it out by pulling it down to the table frame. So I've been round and I've countersunk all these holes suitable for an M4 screw. It's now a nice snug fit in there. It's very rare that I'm going to have the table much lower than this. And there's my vent across the back there to suck air out. I've got very little gap down the side here. Some, but very little. And when you look over at the front of the table there, you'll see why I've got this flange on here. It's so that I can cover up the big gap that's likely to be across the front here. So our air will come in here at this level and go out across there. Now the other thing that I've done is made sure that when I put these holes in, 
it didn't coincide with any of the existing holes. So it's just a matter of drilling a whole load of four millimeter holes through here now. I'll do, a, I'll put one there to lock it, but I mean, this thing is not gonna move because I've locked it up at the corners. That's the table fitted. Here I've got a replacement for the stepper drive bracket. So it's had its position moved that way relative to the fixing points. And I've added a tongue here for fixing the uh, cable chain on with. I've also put a stiff nut along the back edge. This is gonna be mightily stiff, this bracket. I'm most uncomfortable with the fact that I've only got two fixing screws holding this bearing and this gantry together. That's a less of a problem than this. I've only got two fixing screws that are stopping that plate from wobbling. So what I'm going to do now is I've just made myself a little plastic template there with the additional holes in it. So there's four holes on a 26mm centres and I've put two holes in there and made a template which hopefully will enable me to allow me to spot through and it does look as though there are some holes in there which maybe should have been spotted through. So what I've done, I've taken the tapped holes out the top here and opened them up to six mil. Because when I fix my um, bracket on here, I should be using some additional, additional fixing holes. They're nicely centered now. So I'll take my template off. So I'll just put a piece of three millimeter acrylic under there. Just so that I can drill into the acrylic. There we go. Now I'm fixing this in with button head screws because I don't want the heads to stick up too much and damage the edge of the belt. But I do feel comfortable now, when all four of these screws are locked up then, yes, that bearing, that plate is now absolutely rock solid. Now somewhere in there, the belt has turned over. Is it that way? Yes it is, there we go. That's nice and, that's fixed, the belt is the right way around. So we've got four longer screws to fix the motor on, that just makes it easier to get the nuts on. It doesn't matter that they stick down quite a lot. There we go, just one screw fixes that on. We just clip the chain back together because I purposely broke the chain to pull some cable through. I'm going to try and use the bearing itself as the mechanism for switching. There should be enough metal on there that allows me to do that, but that means I can't do that until I've got the head on and I know roughly where I want it to stop so that I can position this switch. Okay, now it looks as though I'm gonna to have to position this switch on a plate of some sort, or a bracket, because I haven't got enough material out the back here. Now the last thing I want to do is add weight to the head here with another bracket to, to trip this sensor. So I'd like to use something that's already here that's metal. I think it's reasonably safe to switch the machine on if I haven't got any loose wires anywhere. I'll just go and check that. No, we can't connect anything up because we've got all these wires that are mains wires. So we'll have to fix the wiring before we can do anything else. Now I'm spending a few hours tracing all the wires around this machine, seeing where they go and uh, trying to make sense. I'll make a drawing of it because there's lots of wires that I don't need and I just don't want to rip them out willy-nilly. I want to take them out and make them safe properly. I mean, here's a classic example. Here are the two wires that I cut out for the mains supply for the fan on the back of the unit. I don't need the fan, so I literally just snipped it off. Um, but now I've got to trace it back and find out where it's connected, how it's connected, and 
take it out properly. Here's how they've pinched the 240 volts. Here's the mains and here's the return. I've taken the insulation tape off of the mains cable. So look, they've snicked a piece of wire, a piece of insulation out of the cable and then they've just wrapped a piece of thinner wire around it and that's how they've borrowed the electricity for the fan. And yet look, just here, we've got the mains input cable about four inches further on for what was the power supply. They could easily have just integrated those thin cables into this boot lace here. Okay, now this borrowing of mains off of one cable is rather alarming because I'm following these white wires back which come off of this LED strip light in the back of the machine. And I was expecting to find them back to something like a, a 24 volt supply or maybe a 12 volt supply to run the LEDs. But when I start pulling the cables out, I find they're borrowing red and blue mains cables. So these two wires that go to feed the LEDs are actually 240 volts. Now when I look a little bit closer at this LED and start taking it apart, click the end off, and the bad thing about this end is, although there's a plug, which is not earthed, I might add, although it's got a three pin plug on that end, on the other end, there's an extension plug, which has got live mains on it. So you could put your finger in there and get a nasty shock. So if you've got one of these LED strip lights in your machine, the first thing I would ask you to do is put a bit of insulation tape over the end there so that you, you actually make it safe. But let's just have a quick look. I'll cut the cables off this end because I'm not going to be using it anymore. And let's take this one out completely. And here we go. Here's our voltage converter for driving the LEDs. It's not what it seems. It's not a safe LED 12 volt system. So this machine is full of surprises. I've just traced the red LED pointer that was on the head back to here. And that's coming off the power supply at five volts DC. So that's completely safe to run the LED strip or any other LED strip that we want to put onto the underneath of the gantry. So I'm going to produce a, a, a diagram of how these, what these switches are doing because I wanted to work out what these switches were operating. And at the moment, they're not operating much at all. Now something else that's very confusing are these sockets here. So one's a USB connection between the PC and the machine, the controller, and the other one is a USB socket. Well, they're both USB sockets, but this one is actually U-Disc. I mean, there's basically only one thing in front of that control switch, and that's the emergency stop switch. So in essence, this is on, off. It turns the machine completely on and off. Everything else becomes disabled when you turn this off. So it's like a master switch. This one is going to remain laser switch on off. And this one, air pump, well, <laughs> it's not gonna be air pump, it's gonna be air assist disable. Now what that's going to do, that's gonna disable the air assist manually. So if you happen to have air assist on during a cycle and you want to turn it off, you can switch it off here, but it won't turn it off completely. What it will do, it'll just disable the valve into bypass mode. So you'll still get air out of your um, nozzle to protect the lens. And that one, well, that one is unused now, but I might decide to put the LED lights from under the gantry on this switch so that we can have the lights on or off. Now, here's the basic circuit for connecting up the air assist switch. Now, in addition to what CloudRay, what you'll see on the CloudRay website, um, we're using the other half of the CloudRay relay that's been supplied to control a fan with a delay on it. So that part there is basically what you'll see on the CloudRay website. And this other part here is something that I've added to this machine 
just because I think it's a useful feature. For those that you are not particularly experienced with reading circuit diagrams, this is very, very simple. Trust me, uh, I'm no electrician myself, but I've made this as a very simple point-to-point -point wiring picture that you should be able to follow easily. Before we go any further, we need to put some tails on this, put some wires on it, because they're soldered on, and we need them in before we really start doing any wiring inside the machine. We don't know how long we want them, but they're about a metre. And we don't need anything special by way of wire. I mean, you could strip the wire out of some ordinary thin cable, if you wish. Um, I just happen to have some very thin um, cable here, which is capable of doing the job. We're only taking a few milliamps, so we only need very thin cable. Now I've got about a metre, just over a metre of red cable there. And I'm gonna have two of those. We need to strip back no more than about three millimetres. Now we've got our solder and our soldering iron. And the first thing we're going to do is just uh, clean our soldering iron. And then we're gonna tin the end. Just melt some solder on the end, like that. Okay, and then once you've got a little pool of solder on there, you can just touch it on the end of your wire, like that. And that will put a little puddle of solder right on the end of the wire. The tricky bit are these little terminals here. So you don't, certainly don't need a big soldering iron, you want a fairly small tip. And what we're going to do is tin the two centre ones and two end ones. It doesn't matter which end you do because this can work either way round. Just, we just tin our soldering iron and then we'll just try and get a little puddle like that onto the terminal. Okay, now it's probably best if you do turn it over and do the centre one from the other side. And there we go. So we've got little puddles of solder on each one of those terminals now. Okay, now that we've got our blob of solder on there, I'm going to stand my solder on the switch to act as a, an extra hand almost. We might just trim these pieces of wire so they're around about three millimetres, two to three millimetres long. And then what we're trying to do is just remelt the solder and let the wire fuse into the puddle. That's two red wires on. If you look at the way in which this second set is connected, it looks as though we've got one, two, three wires. In fact, we only need one wire, one black wire. So again, we'll have the same sort of length, about a metre. We've got to strip a piece enough to cover two terminals. Just twist the end of the wire to make it neat and just check you've got enough wire to cover both terminals. A little bit of solder on it and then just run it along your wire and there we go we've tinned the wire. And this time we'll orientate it so that it's the right way for you to work with your hands. So you need to feel comfortable about this. Just a little teeny weeny blob of solder on the end there. And then we're going to lay the wire across the terminals this time and fuse the wires like that across the terminals. Now I've got some little rubber sleeves here. We we'll thread the rubber onto the end of the wire and pull it right the way back to the switch. And just to keep them nice and neat, I've just got a small tie wrap here, which I'll use to bundle up the cables with. Now we've got manual on at the top and automatic at the bottom. And basically what that means is when you switch it down, you're disabling this bypass. So what we need to do is make sure when we fit this inside here, we put the wires at the bottom, not at the top. And then the label will be the correct way round. Now I would put the, uh, the crinkly washer on first. Clamp it up fairly tight. And then you've got a second lock nut or a second nut which you can put on the front to act as a lock nut. 
and that's our switch mechanically fitted now we're going to have to do the wiring now that we've got our air assist switch in those people that know how to wire up a machine and read a circuit diagram you might as well jump on a little bit because what I'm going to do now is tediously work my way through the way in which we should wire these components up in here particularly the relays and the timers it, for the benefit of those people that are a little bit mm, uncertain about electric electrics I think before we start any of this we ought to clear these two switches down here we're gonna have to rip some wires off so that we can take these unused mains wires away now if you like to just come inside the cabinet with me you'll see that it's a bit of a a bit of a rat's nest up there look all sorts of wires and what we're going to have to do we're going to have to take these wires off the bottom here but we've still got to maintain there are links between these wires which we mustn't disturb so we've got to take for instance there's a link from this power here this 240 volts here there's a link down to here and there's another link down to here well we've got to break that 240 volt link rather than climbing around inside the cabinet look we could just inside here we can just these are pressing fittings so we can just unclip push a little bit on the back of the switch and the front of the switch and we should be able to pull all these switches out so we've got much easier access to the wiring first thing we can do is to take the switch take the wiring off these bottom switches because they're the switches that we want to reuse in a different way and we should find that this air pump pair and let me just disconnect them separately so that they don't get in each other's way I should find that that one is that one so magic I should cut this little ferrule off first and then all of a sudden it should pull out easily yeah it can look very intimidating all these wires but hey we're making life simpler because we're removing some of them now we'll take this pair out here which is the bottom switch and again we'll just cut the boot laces off so that or the boot lace ferrules off so that the wires pull out easily that should be that one the blue one is be connect will be connected to somewhere else it's that one there this is the end link in the chain where the blue wire carries on and connects to many other things and technically what I've got to do I've got to make that connection there back into there that's the blue ongoing link established now we've got to do the same for the red so we've got to get rid of those two links and make a new connection onto here so there we go we've removed the extra links and we've now just got two switches in there and as you can see it's a lot tidier now now to those guys that are not particularly familiar with circuit diagrams let me just very basically explain quickly how this controller works now this is the air assist solenoid which is driven by 24 volts and this is the um, the main control solenoid for switching the system on and off which is the solenoid supplied by Cloudray in the kit and then further over here we've got a timer which we'll talk about later but let's just stay with the basic connections to the air assist solenoid and the control relay now this 24 volts goes two ways at this point okay it goes this way to the air assist solenoid valve and it goes this way to the control relay let's just work our way through and show you what happens 24 volts goes to the air assist solenoid and while the system is not working i.e the controller is saying i don't want any air assist there will be no current flow down this line there will be voltage here 24 volts and the 24 volts will appear through here and it will still be 24 volts all the way down here through here and this switch here would normally be closed and that's this switch here which we're going to use okay so that will be closed so that's 24 volts all the way down here 24 volts right down to this point here at number five so if i measure the voltage difference between six and five when the solenoid valve is off it'll be zero now when the controller says ah I want some air assist now turn it on blowing on internally what that does there's a switch internally which connects wind to ground 
and as soon as wind and ground are connected all the voltage drains away from this side of the circuit here and we now get 24 volts difference across the solenoid valve itself. So you'll have 24 volts to here and then it will be zero almost down to there and down to ground and that will make the current flow through this coil here which will energize the relay and as soon as this switch is off this line will go back to 24 volts again. What we're going to do first of all is to wire these two lines in the wind and the 24 volt and I think we'll start off with the wind we work our way back to here to this particular switch because this is a very convenient point to start. Here we've got one wire that comes back from our solenoid valve. This is the white wire, remember, that we installed. Now this is the white wire here. And you'll see what I've done. I've stripped it back so that we've got lots and lots of cable here left over. So I, we didn't know how much cable we wanted and we still don't know how much cable we want so what we do we'll just work with these one cable at a time we don't need the earth wire so we can cut the earth wire off because that's just a nuisance and now we've just got two pieces of cable the blue and the brown and the blue is going to be the negative side to ground so we take a look at our diagram here and we say well look this is the positive side which is the brown side which is going to be connected to 24 volts that's not what we want to start with what we want to do is we want to work with the blue wire which is going to be this one and we're going to connect it to here that and that are connected when you switch and that and that are connected when you switch but they're two completely separate switches so we only want one of those switches and we'll leave ourselves enough blue cable in there to just tie it all into that loop there now I've purposely done that wrong by just thinking one step ahead, i.e. of connecting this cable to K, the switch. I need this red cable that's coming from the air assist switch to go in there as well. Well, I've done it wrong purposely to demonstrate that you need to think ahead when you're doing this. So what we're going to have to do is remake this. And at the same time that we're doing this, we need to pull one of these wires through. It doesn't matter which one. Again, we just leave some slack in there. And just so you don't get confused, it's probably a good idea to do something like that. Look, there's the red wire and there's our blue wire. Okay, so that's what we've done so far. Now, this is nice and simple. Look, coming out the end, the other side of that switch, all we've got to do is make a connection into the number five terminal on the controller. And to do that, I'm going to use a slightly different sort of connector. I think coming out of there we'll probably use black cable because that's that's going to ground and it's DC. So we've got a nice firm connection on there. So we've now got to get to terminal number five which is that one there which is wind that's running through that piece of trunking there and just drop down there somewhere like that. Now you could wire these directly in with bits of bare wire but I like to put terminations on. I mean, they've done they've done a half decent job of tailing all these ends off with little bootlace um, crimps. And then just to get access to that, we can disconnect the plug. Okay, so now we can put that one in there. And for the time being, we'll just pop that back in there. Okay, so we can now pencil that line in blank. <clears throat> so this 24 volt line here coming back from the solenoid was our white cable. So it's gonna have a piece of brown wire there. This one is going to be 24 volts, so it's going to be red wire. So I think the convenient point to make a joint is at terminal 6. So here is our brown wire. And again, hmm, I think we'll bring it in at the bottom there, run it up that cable, run it up that network of cables there, and across the top, and down into... It would normally be terminal 6, 24 volt. We've got 24 volts in there already. Something is already using that. But if we look below here, we shall find we've got another 24 volt. There's no reason why we can't use that 24 volt from this terminal. And so that's what we're going to do. So we'll just cut that off there. So we've picked up our 24 volt supply and sent it to the air assist solenoid. What we've now got to do 
is to pick up the other side of the 24 volt which is the red cable and we've got to send it to this relay here. Now it's going to go to connection number 14 which would also be internationally known as A2. Now that's the plus side. There isn't a plus and a minus side but in fact we are going to nominate the plus side as being 14. So where is terminal 14 on here? Well that's why when we had the whole thing out we decided to draw a picture. Okay so terminal 14 is actually that one there which is right at this top right hand corner. We've got a fit of diode across A1 and A2 and that's going to make it quite difficult so what I'm going to have to do is integrate the diode into the two wires that go into there. So here's the little diode that they supply and on one end you'll see there's a sort of a silver or white bar. Now that's the plus end and what we've got to do we've got to put the plus end to the red wire and what we'll do we'll wind this onto the end here and then we'll crimp them together. So let's just mark what we've done so far. We've got the brown wire into there and then we've got the red wire out of there into A2. Right, so just to keep our drawing up to date here's what we've done. We've done that one now. I didn't take that cable into that ground just there. I took it into this ground here. It doesn't matter where you find a ground. Any one of the places where it says ground will be the same. Now we're going to make a connection between our switch, which has got a red wire coming out of it, remember, into four, which is status. And then we've got a black wire coming out the, let's call it the negative side of that relay, A1, which has got to go back to status as well. And we make a connection into the status line. And this is where we're going to have to make the negative side of the diode connect up to this line here. And there we are, we've got our little diode now connected between the plus and the minus. And we've done that line there now. Diode as well there. So that's basically the low voltage control side of the system. So now we'll take a look in here at the solenoid valve and we'll take the cap off. And they put that little slot in there for a reason, obviously, so you can take the cap off. <laughs> I've cut the diode wires down to about half an inch long on each end, and I've tucked it into the brown wire there. I'm now going to remove the blue wire, but before you put the blue wire back, bend the diode and get that into the hole as well. So we've got the diode across there tucked in the hole and then we'll pop that blue wire back in there and that's a very neat invisible way of losing the diode. So we can now complete that part of the picture as well. So now we've done this bit we're going to look at the bigger picture and start connecting mains into these connections here and into these relays and timers. And we're going to do that with 10 amp cable. The cheapest way to buy cable as in the form of a, an IEC cable or a computer cable. You can get three meters of this for probably less than two dollars and you get three 10 amp cables in there each of the right color. Now although it's not essential for current carrying capacity to have heavy duty cable into this relay here, this delay timer here, we're going to use all the same cables because that then keeps it clear that this is all mains cable, 240 volt. Although this looks like a fairly complicated path here, in reality what we're going to do is to link these two together here with a tail and then we'll link these two together here and we'll pull this tail in as well. Yeah, We'll have a double connection on one of these, a double connection on there, a single on there and a single into there. So it's not going to be difficult at all. Now we've just done that one there into 11. We've already linked like this and we've got a tail on it and that tail has got to go into A2 and then we're going to bring this one down and we're going to connect that together 
in here. So we're going to try and probably put two connections into that A2 on the timer delay relay. Or we can bring them in as two separate cables like this and join them there with one connection. That's what we'll do. Well, we've done all our wiring by numbers now and we've hopefully got all of the cables in. I'm not going to tidy them up until I've proved that it all works. I'm moderately confident, but not going to waste too much time doing it to start with. We've got to make this earth properly. And to do that, I've, I've got the original earth connection, but I've drilled a hole down here. And the key thing that was missing before was a metal to metal connection. So I'm just going to remove the paint around this hole. And now we've got bare metal exposed onto which at least this piece will connect. But we can go a little bit better than that and do it the proper way, which is to put an M5 external crinkle washer on there, which guarantees when you tighten it up that even if you've got something like a metal coating on here, it should spike its way through and make a contact. Well, it's a bank holiday today and everybody's out in their garden uh, doing things, cutting the grass as you can hear the guy next door is doing. Um, my dad was a bit of a philosopher and he warned me when I got married, he said, son, he said, never have any more grass than your wife will mow. And I haven't got any grass. I probably can test this electrical system before I finish off the mechanicals. Okay, well, I think we're just about ready to start firing this thing up again for real. now. Obviously nothing is going to move because I've got the X belt disconnected so the stepper motor will drive but the Y stepper motor won't drive because that's disconnected as well. Over the back there we've got the Y sensor but I can't get to that to remove it and reposition it until I take this out. So this is not permanently fixed at the moment. It's got to come out and have fixings in so there are lots of mechanical things to be sorted out if we find the electrics is working okay. Right, let's turn the power on and see what happens. Nothing. Well, that's because I've done a very stupid thing. I haven't released the emergency stop button. Let's see what happens now. We have power. So yeah, we've got number 14 is flashing. So the machine has reset itself perfectly okay. Well, here's the new head completely assembled with its mirror. And I'm pretty pleased with the way that that design has come out actually. I've made one or two small changes from the Mark One. Now I'm not gonna deny it. It's been a little bit tricky getting that on. well but we're there and there we go right so we have to check first of all whether the belt is touching on the frame which it is because of all the adjustment I've got on the motor bracket I can move the bracket forward and make sure the belt clears the back of the gantry. It's a bit tricky getting to these screws but once they're done it's a once-off job. They're nicely clamped and that bracket is now really solid in all sorts of planes before I even attempt to bolt this down. So we've got plenty of adjustment on the screws here to push it forward, which is what we want to do. We've got to push it forward to get it tight, 
pushed onto the pulley. So you've got to push it forward. And then I've got to lock the stepper motor up in that position. Drill through onto a piece of wood, 4.2. I know there's nothing behind there because I checked. got a small problem I could take the head off and get access to that or I could drill another hole in there um, I think another hole is the only really alternative so we need to get to the second screw so I need a hole that's probably at least there I can put a little plug in that one it will then look as though I intended it only you will know that I made a mistake but Promise me you won't tell anyone. There we go. You can get a square peg in a round hole. And here is why you have to um, put the mirror plate on second. Because the mirror plate just probably can interfere with the flange on this wheel. Just. But once the flange, once the motor is put in, you can, uh, you can put that plate on with impunity. It all sits nice and clear. There we go, that's on. Now we've got to tighten up the tensioners and see what we get. So that's interesting, it's sounds smooth one way and not the other. So what's the problem? Got to take the mirror off again because it's masking the holes. It's taking a little bit of tension off of it. What I'm trying to do, I'm trying to push the belt into engagement with the teeth. Let me just tighten up those screws. And now we've got a bit more tension on the belt. That sound, now sounds good. Now, I've put these holes in here, especially these along the back here in case we want to put a tapped hole in there and lock that tension. I don't think it's going to need it to be honest. I think the tension that I've put on the um, on the belt via the stepper motor fixings is going to be adequate. But you know, if you need to, you could always put a tapped hole in there, then adjust the tension and then tighten up the stepper motor. But you saw how I managed to achieve it without it. So maybe we don't need this clamp bracket on here especially i mean the main reason why this was on here was to stop the twist of the mirror but i mean this bracket is so stiff now the mirror is not going to twist well now i want to try and fix this sensor on somewhere here but at the moment as soon as i turn it on this head is not going to go that way towards this sensor because I've now reversed the direction in which the motor is operating on the belt. I'm going to have to go and change the direction of the motor in the vendor settings soon, but for the time being, when we turn this on, the Y will go nowhere because we still haven't got it connected up, and the X will go that way looking for a zero. So we can fool the system with our screwdriver when we turn it on. So the good news is that I can detect off of the back of that bearing, as you can see. All I've got to do is find a suitable position and make a little plate to mount this on from the back here. Now I've made myself a very simple bracket out of a piece of uh, 8 or 10 millimeter thick acrylic. It's got a couple of M3 tapped holes in it there and I've put a slot across the back there. I've also drilled and tapped an M3 hole in the back of the gantry there. Just one. Here's what I'm trying to achieve. This does not interfere with this bracket here. Look, I've got plenty of room underneath. So there's no chance of this 
hitting that. I just need to make sure that that is clear of that. I've got that set up about a millimetre clear of this metal part of the bearing at the back here. So now all I've got to do is find the on off position by sliding this along like that. Now I can slide it back until it just comes on like that and that's my zero position. We'll just begin to tidy up these cables at this end and uh, pull all the slack back through the cable chain. Now to do that what I've done I've prized apart the cable chain just here so that we've got two half chains now and the beauty of that is that this is a straight line and we can pull the cable we can pull the air pipe back so it's nice and neat. You can do the same with the sensor cable but what we've now got to do is to pull this back into the machine. So that's all fairly neat at the end now. The only thing that we've got left floating around here at the moment is this thing which we're not going to make a decision on at the moment. I've got to go and find some LEDs and probably as I said we're going to mount them underneath the gantry here. Just have a bit of a tidy up. Now if you look carefully at this y-axis <coughs> you'll see I can't even get to the screws under there to take it off because it's going to be masked by this tray here which was holding the tube. How did they do it? If you can't get it let's make a bloody great big hole. <laughs> now I'm just checking the stroke of Y because we can come forward to about there without hitting this 315, 318. So we should be able to make this machine bigger by at least 10 mil. Just means I can then comfortably do 300 by 500 pieces of material on here or engravings on here with some overrun. Here we've got a particularly poor piece of design which I think I'm going to have to fix. The way in which the belt is fixed on at the front here means that when it passes around this idler pulley here, look, you can see how it's not parallel with the rail. It's actually running in at an angle, which means as it gets to this end, there's got a tendency to put a load backwards on the bearing. The belt length doesn't change, but it wants to change by a small amount by doing this. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to mount that belt behind its fixing in some way. But we're not going to do that at the moment, but eventually I want that to run parallel with this bearing. Okay well I've now mounted the Y sensor what I'm going to do is sense underneath the gantry so it really doesn't matter where along here I choose because the gantry is the same all the way along so I don't have to be tucked right up in that corner. 315 there we go and that's where I'm going to set the sensor. Just check again About there somewhere, there we go, about there. I'll just clean all the junk out from here as we go, as we've more or less finished that side. Well here's the, here's the, uh, the tube mount tray at the back of the machine which I've just laid in here at the moment and I've marked the centre line because on this centre line I'm going to be supporting it with this bracket. Remember the middle of it was a little bit flexible. Can't afford to have it flexible. So we're going to support it with a bracket. We've fixed that shelf in nice and solid now. Um, next time we shall be reaching the point where we've got to reinstall the RF unit back into here and fix it in so that it's adjustable. And uh, we've got to sort the control unit out, the vendor settings, because at the moment the x-axis is working backwards. And uh, we've got to set the table parameters up. What size? At the moment it says 500 by 300, but I suspect we should be able to get 510 or 515 by 315. So until then, thanks for your time and patience, and um, we look forward to the next session.